Welcome to the New Process Podcast. Learn all the tools, methods, and best practices combined with people, emotions, and a a human-centric mindset to rethink your process and push it to the next level. Uh, And here here is your host, Marco Kloppenberg. Yeah, welcome to episode 44 of the New Process Podcast. Today, it's all about the hot EPM skills in 2024. Therefore, I'm talking to Spitnev Misia. Spitnev is the, uh, let's call him the creator of an impressive research work, which is called BPM Skills Hot or Not. As part of his research, he asks BPM thought leaders, practitioners, and people from academia, which BPM topics are currently hot and which are not relevant anymore from their individual perspective. I'm super honored that he is sharing the results and providing insights onto the BPM Skills 2024 research in the New Process podcast today. Besides his outstanding research, Spitnev is Senior Consultant at BOC Information Technologies Consulting since 2006. BOC Group is the company behind the BPM tool Adonis, you might be aware of. Spitnev blogs about BPM at bpmtips.com, a blog he already started in 2008. He holds a master's degree in business informatics from SGH Warsaw School of Economics. Smitjev lives in Warsaw together with his wife and his daughter. Personally, he likes to sing and read and he's a real BPM enthusiast. He even published a BPM course on Udemy and he also published a BPM book in Polish language and he is working on an English book too. So in this episode, you'll learn what the hot BPM skills are, which you have to learn for 2024, which skills are not relevant anymore. And for sure, we'll also talk about his BPM experiences and his recommendations on how to get people excited for processes. So enjoy the interview with Spignev. And now let's start to rethink processes. Yeah, welcome to the new process podcast, Spignev. It's so cool to have you here. I feel super honored to be part of your Hot BPM Skills 2024 research and even more honored to talk about this today. So welcome to the New Process Podcast, Spitnev. Thank you very, very much for having me. Thanks for the invitation and thanks for participating in my post. Sure, absolutely. But before we talk about these amazing outcomes, results, let's start with a check-in. So What do you prefer in an aircraft, aisle or window seat? This is a little bit complicated question. This is the question I was afraid because I don't fly that much. For me, the train is preferred way of traveling, but both in a plane and in a train, I prefer window seats because I enjoy having uh, nice views. And for me, it is much better time if I can watch the beautiful landscapes uh, from the window seat. Yeah, that's, that's very good. And what is your favorite airport? Well, since I don't fly a lot, I don't have experiences like many of your guests. So I will only mention the Warsaw Chopin Airport because this is uh, this is the one where I normally leave the Poland and uh, return. So this is pretty nice if I can watch the Warsaw from the from the plane, especially at night. So it looks beautiful, and for me, it means that okay, I'm coming home in in a few minutes, so maybe not few minutes, but uh, half an hour or hour. I'll be back home. So this is, is the airport that I like very much. Okay. And what, what is your favorite train station then? <laughs> Central Warsaw <laughs> Station. It is even <laughs> closer to my home. So when I'm there, I know that I'll be home very, very soon. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's cool. And what was the best process you have ever experienced? It is complicated. So generally speaking, uh, there are many, many processes around us. Uh, I would say a little bit uh, jokingly that there are two kinds of processes that I enjoy very much. First uh, process is the process of buying bread in my local bakery. It is not fast. It is not very efficient because it requires effort from my side. I need to take a walk. I need to wait a little bit. Uh, the bread is not the cheapest. Uh, but the ladies working there know my family very well. They know what we like. So when I'm ordering something, they are 
wondering, hmm, only half of this bread? Why not full? Ah, we additionally have this and this. Maybe your wife uh, or your daughter will enjoy this. So this is incredible that uh, they really know what we like. Uh, they give awesome recommendations. So this is an example of process which is very, very much oriented about personal touch, but uh, the costs, efficiency are not topics there. So yeah. this is one of the processes that I like very much. And other group of processes that are totally fascinating for me are the e-commerce processes. It is incredible how easy, convenient it is to order something. I can simply use my smartphone, click, order groceries, order some other stuff, and uh, very, very quickly I can get uh, what I wanted. <laughs> I had a chance to discuss some time ago with one of our clients uh, who are a big logistics company, and they said that actually they had to, let's say, downgrade their capacity because they made a process that was so efficient that customers were ordering and the courier was waiting uh, with the staff and the people were not ready for it. So <laughs> they had to add some add some more space so that people who were ordering were actually ready to pick up the things that they ordered. <laughs> so for me, those e-commerce uh, processes are amazing because this is super fast, super convenient. So the customer experience is totally awesome. And the cool thing about those processes is that uh, for the customer, they look so easy. I simply yeah. grab the application. I simply click, scroll, pay. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, I have it. Yeah. But on the back end, there are lots of things happening. So there are processes for the actual company that does something. There are processes for the company that handles payments. There are processes for the logistics company because you may have something delivered by the courier or maybe do you prepare some kind of parcel locker and so on. So it is incredible how easy it seems for the customer, but how complex it is on the back end. And I must ask you again, a little bit joke, King here. Do you know the concept of duck theory? I know it from Steve Towers. Okay, no, no. Tell me more. Duck theory is very important theory about processes and uh, customer experience. So the top of the duck looks cute. It oh, falls yeah. on the lake so beautifully without any kind of effort. But below the surface, you have crazy puddling. So the customer experience part looks super easy, smooth, and wonderful. But the processes, internal processes, there is a lot of going on and customers are not aware of what is happening. There. And this is actually good because they don't need to understand what yeah. is happening. They are just interested about their, well, results. They are not yeah. interested how it happens, but they want to have what we ordered quickly and without any problems. So this is interesting intersection of uh, customer experience, customer journeys, and processes. And as you could see, there are places where we really care about uh, speed, efficiency, our customer experience, and places where we don't care about uh, those things because we care more about relations about the social aspect of uh, mm -hmm. of uh, meeting other people and uh, processes that are not, uh, let's say, optimal. Yeah, I heard about that duck theory before when I talked to J.M. Erdenson in the Aris interview, when we talked about Aris, he described Aris as a duck, exactly as you did. Okay, let's not talk about Aris here, but I wasn't aware that there's a real theory, um, which is called duck theory. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it is a joke. I learned about it from Steve Towers. They had uh, in one of his courses, I think with his uh, colleague James, I think uh, they created this duck theory. Okay. <laughs> and Steve told me when I mentioned it, oh no, not the duck theory. I <laughs> hope that everyone forgot about it, but it was so cute. So great example. So I thought that it is worth preserving. It is worth mentioning. Absolutely. Yeah. We we can now re always refer to this story. That, that's yes, because perfect. Because it is easy to understand, easy to remember, and it has a deep meaning below. So I hope exactly. that this concept of duck theory will help some of the listeners of podcasts think about what do they do 
and how do they organize their processes so yeah. they look wonderful for the they look wonderful for their customers but they are aware that uh, inside the company there is a lot of lots of additional things going on this is a little bit more complicated so yeah. I think it's this duck theory is based on old uh, jokes. So be like duck above the surface, look composed and unruffled, but below the surface, paddle like hell. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's super cool. And uh, this already tells a little bit about your relationship to process. But I have to ask, how would you describe your relationship to processes? I would say laugh at first sight. Oh. On my fourth year of studies, I was participating, uh, I attended, uh, I think it was computer class mm -hmm. for generally database uh, oriented uh, stuff. And one of the lectures had something to do with processes. For me, processes were not something I knew that many about. And I saw those wonderful boxes, arrows. We had to model the process. We have to simulate it. It was moving. I thought, wow. Later on, I've, I learned that you can actually do it for a living. Uh, my colleagues uh, during studies mm, from big four companies told, no, no, this is something only, only technical guys are doing it. You will never earn a living by doing it if you're not an IT guy. And I'm not an IT guy. So I thought, hmm, maybe, but I tried and luckily it worked and by helping people work with their arrows rectangles uh, <laughs> i can do i can do lots of cool things so this is this is incredible That's amazing. i think some years ago we had an interview with uh, sandeep jahal it was also kind of a fun type of interview and uh, we made a joke that i'm abnormally attracted to arrows and rectangles <laughs> <laughs> so this would be a summary of my relationship with processes. <laughs> that's that's perfect. And now you you are still working as a senior consultant for BOC Group, and you're doing this since 2006. So wow, what a huge time frame! And BOC is uh, the maker of Adonis. Yeah, actually, I haven't had an Adonis interview in the past, but I had a closer look onto that when we selected the tool for a customer. So I'm still aware of that, but this is not the topic today. Maybe we can do a separate episode on that. But what was your With favorite pleasure. BPM project in this unbelievable long time span you are working as a consultant for BPM? Good question. I had quite a lot of projects and working at BIOS Group is super interesting. So I don't recall any boring day, any day that I thought, oh no, again, the same. So every day is a very interesting day because it is wonderful if you can help the customers, if you can help them with modeling, if you can help them with the tool, and especially if you can see that when you're coming into the company, they are struggling with something. So for example, people are spending way too much time on simple things that because their processes are not, uh, not properly organized. And when you see that those people are overworked, They are tired. They don't have mm -hmm. time for their families because they are staying long hours. They need to work during the weekends because something is wrong. They need to be firefighting. You probably know the joke about the level zero of process maturity about being firefighters. Mm -hmm. So it is incredible if uh, at the end of this project, we can see that those people now see that processes are running smoothly. They simply disappear. And now it is not a big deal to do something. Things mm -hmm. are simply happening. You don't need to be a great hero that stays long hours, that struggles to win finally and deliver the result. Like the processes that are running smoothly make it look no problem. Mm -hmm. So this is wonderful if you can see how it helps people. And also when we had pro when we had projects uh, of uh, helping customers with process improvement, with process automation, when we could see what is personally very important for me. Obviously for management, mm -hmm. other KPIs are important because uh, the customers and managers see that, okay, we were able to earn more, we could save that amount of money. But for me, it was incredible if we could see that people who had very, very, very difficult job that uh, made them burnt out, uh, 
and they had a huge rotation. They got support from IT. But again, important thing, those people were not fired uh, because, okay, we have this automated, we don't need you anymore. But they got additional training. They could be reskilled. They could take new positions in the company that were more interesting, that had uh, other requirements. So for me, it was awesome that the company had the benefit, but also people were not fired. They were not really removed because we don't need you anymore because we have the automation. Mm -hmm. So I, obviously I cannot tell about details because I have NDAs for, <laughs> uh, well, nearly all of the projects that I have. But uh, what I can tell you, because this is something that you can find on the internet, is uh, that I had a chance uh, to help a little bit the project team that was doing a project uh, with NFZ, so this Polish National Health, Health uh, Fund, mm -hmm. and they were creating uh, clinical pathways uh, for various diseases, for example, mm -hmm. for conditions like diabetes or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So it is incredible that uh, when I think that uh, by helping those people, model the processes, think about the processes, improve the knowledge transfer. And the doctors uh, in various, various hospitals may have better knowledge. They may mm -hmm. be helping their patients better. So it is incredible to think that uh, we as uh, process practitioners can not only improve the bottom line, save time, save money, do things like this, but we can also help people recover mm -hmm. sooner save lives and do yeah. good things like that. So this is, for me, incredible stuff. And those are things that I remember with pleasure. And here comes the sponsor of today's New Process Podcast episode. I must share something really cool with you today. I've been using the language tool browser plugin for a while, and it just became New Process Partner of the Month. Language Tool is an AI-powered writing assistant for all common browsers and word processors. I use it a lot for writing my emails in the Outlook web app. And even more interesting, I'm using it in my process modeling sessions directly in all web-based BPM tools. So while mapping processes, Language Tool continuously checks my writing. Errors will be underlined in different colors. Language Tool highlights spelling and grammar errors as well as comma placement in several languages. It automatically detects in which language you are writing. It marks style issues and offers suggestions for improvement. You can even ask for synonyms or let the AI rewrite your text by double-clicking. So it's super easy. Just click onto the underlined words and uh, get suggestions for improvement. Language Tool makes writing for detailed descriptions of activities and process super easy. And the workshop participants are always curious to see what Language Tool brings up as ideas for improvement. It works perfectly in the browser without the need for administrator rights. You can use its free version, but I truly recommend using the premium version for advanced grammar and spelling checks and even more suggestions. I really love it. To try it out, just go to newprocesslab.com slash language tool. Yeah, I fully agree. I'm working with a customer whose purpose is to save people's lives. And it's amazing to show how all the employees contribute to this purpose based on their processes and to, their, and to do their best to save people's lives. And that's, I, I just love it. That's super cool. Thank you for these insights. And so you... So uh, just to be, just to make it clear, well, I did not do anything meaningful. I just helped those people exactly. who are doing yeah. actual stuff do their job. So it was like, hmm bringing pencils to a painter who does the great things. So I'm bringing pencils. Yeah, that's I'm understatement. But small yeah. things, but it is great if I can see that I could help people who are doing awesome stuff. So this yeah. is something that I'm very, very happy and very proud of. Yeah, that's true. Cool. And I think already in 2008, you founded bpmtips.com. Can you tell us a little bit more about why you did that? And um, how did the BPM world look like back then? From your perspective yeah it's quite a long time since yeah. that, since that time how the time passes it is incredible so generally speaking i must say that i enjoy learning new things uh, a lot and i like sharing the things that i learned with others mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So for me, it was always fun to share with others. And I thought that maybe it would be helpful if I put uh, those things that I had a chance to learn online on my blog. Mm -hmm. So I put uh, first uh, the blog on WordPress.com. Then I moved to my own domain. So BPM tips, so practical things. So so this Mm -hmm. is why tips. Mm-hmm. BPM tips. And uh, back then in Poland, it looked like this, that uh, processes were not uh, actually hot. We had situations when when we were talking with our customers, you know, we had a meeting, we had a presentation, and they spent 20 minutes. You could see that they are starting to think, and then they said, uh, so actually, you're not doing some kind of workflow or document uh, management. You are only modeling boxes Mm -hmm. and arrows. (laughs) (laughs) So for many companies, it was totally crazy just to model processes. Why? If you automate it, it makes sense, but to model processes and think together how to improve them, why would you do such crazy thing? So my idea is, uh, and was back then, to ask people from markets where there is uh, better BPM maturity, how does the situation look like, mm-hmm. so that uh, people from countries like Poland and others can also benefit from it. And it turned out that uh, because I decided to make it everything in English, I had readers from, well, nearly all the world. It was incredible uh, to see that uh, those posts were helpful from people from various, various countries where I could never be, where I could never visit them and we, I could never help them personally. And this way they were, they were able to get some cool ideas from kind people that participated in my posts. So this is something incredible. And since 2008, the BPM tips is developing. I also, sometime later, started publishing courses on process mm-hmm. modeling on Udemy platform. So this is other part of what I'm doing. Yeah. Okay. We can put the, the links into the show notes for sure. And in the meantime, you pushed it even further. So to provide full transparency to our listeners, we are recording this on the 16th of January. The episode will be published if everything turns out the way it's supposed to on the 24th of January. And in the meantime, you're planning to publish your results of your latest research work. You yes. did that already for the eighth time, if I'm not wrong. It's about the BPM skills in 2024, hot or not. So amazing work, amazing people. But how did it all start? How did you come up with the idea of doing this research work and publishing the hot or not so hot topics of the specific year? This is a fun story. So everything started uh, because uh, in 2016, I was teaching students about process modeling uh, during the MBA course at at Kosminski University. So one of the best uh, business schools in this part of Europe. And uh, it was meant uh, to give them something more than modeling. So I showed them how to model in BPMN, how to use the process architectures, how does the BPM generally look like. And I thought it would be super cool if I could also help them professionally to figure Mm -hmm. out what to expect, what skills will be beneficial for them, which elements will be hot. So this is why we picked the hot or not format and which uh, things are not something that they should be investing very heavily. And I have to tell you that I'm very, very, very weak at predicting the future. So just to mention a few examples. When I saw for the first time BPM and I thought, no, this is totally crazy. Nobody will use it. This is too technical, too complicated. Business will never, absolutely never use it. You were right, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would, as uh, since I had a chance to teach thousands of people worldwide BPM, and I would say that I was pretty stupid <laughs> to some extent. So I had the same ideas about RPA. RPA, no way, it will never work. So luckily, very luckily, I decided to follow the known proverb. So plans fail for the lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. So I thought, okay, it's big enough, let's do it like this. Let's ask people who are smarter than you are and who have a better feeling of what the future may hold. And uh, 
I'm incredibly grateful that uh, so many people decided to answer. So over 10 great BPM experts decided to invest their time to share their ideas, to share their knowledge with uh, with my students and also with my blog readers. So mm -hmm. I'm very grateful to this day, additionally, because many of those participants from this first edition of POST are still participating to this day. So this is something really heartwarming. And I have to say big thank you to all of them. Yeah, This was incredible. So the idea was to publish something that would help the students. And additionally, I put it online. And it turned out that this is something that people find useful. and. Uh, I thought that, okay, maybe let's do it one more time and then one more time. So it grew a little bit. So in years where I have more than, let's say, 20 or 30 answers, I normally try to split it. So there were some years that I had two editions of this post a year. I think even one case where I had three. Wow. So this is incredible that... Uh, that uh, those people were so kind that they took time to answer the questions. The original questions were, what are the skills that the BPM practitioners should add to their toolbox in 2016? Okay. And uh, which skills are no longer relevant or not practically available yet as hype? So this was the hot and not. Yeah, okay. So this is what uh, we did originally in the first edition. Okay, that's that's super cool. And can you be a little more specific, in, just in general, uh, who did you invite? What kind of people are sharing their ideas on, on the relevant topics? So generally speaking, I always try to invite uh, people who have various views. So there will be some BPM practitioners, but also people from academia, people who are not in the BPM area, for example, and BAs, but also people who may have interesting perspectives. For example, in 2018, I invited Anand Sanval from CB Insights, who is totally not uh, involved in any way in business process management, but uh, he's from the market research company who are doing, by the way, awesome job. If you're interested in market research, if you want to learn more about any kind of uh, specific market, CB Insights uh, should be your go-to localization. And Anand, uh, in his answer, where he shared his experiences, because his company was doing what we are generally doing now with uh, Jenna Relative AI, he told, how does he see the new ways of uh, supporting organizations with handling lots of data, with lots of knowledge available in a digital form? So for me, it is incredible to have participants from various backgrounds. So from tool vendors, from consulting companies, from universities that are sharing their perspectives about processes, that mm -hmm. are telling how do they see the processes, uh, what problems do they see? What possibilities do they see? Which elements do they think will be hot? Which elements are, in their perspective, no longer relevant? So I try to make it pretty broad, and I think it uh, it works pretty nicely. So in the first edition, I had a great, uh, great list of participants. As I told you, many of them are still participating today, so just uh, if we go by the alphabet, it was Josef Maria Kos, Lloyd Dugan, Ian Gotts, Harold Quinn from BOC Group, from my company, mm -hmm. Professor Marcella Rosa, Alberto Manuel, Nathaniel Palmer, Adrian Reed, who is the BI business the analyst that I mentioned. I enjoy very much answers from Adrian because he gives uh, the BI perspective, which mm -hmm. is super, super valuable. Clay Richardson, Pedro Bledo, Alexander Samaran. Jim Siner, John Tasmer, so incredible group of, of experts uh, who were so kind to, to share their knowledge with others. Yeah, that's super cool. And what were the hot topics back then in 2016? Well, here I may <laughs> say that not all the participants always agree. And this is the part of why this is so super interesting, super valuable. Yeah. But I would say from their answers, of course, if you want to go read uh, on my website and decide on your own what do you think will be their takes what uh, do you think uh, were the most important things for them for me i would say that there was 
maybe consensus would be too much, but many of them mentioned that customer journeys, customer experience were the topics that were super hot and super relevant and worth exploring further. Okay. Oh, that's, that's interesting. And how did it develop over time? So how did the topics change? Before we talk about what is hot today, but just to have a look back, how did it develop? It was very interesting. So many topics appeared, many topics uh, were mentioned. So we had RPA, we have lots of mentions of various types of automation. So mm -hmm. no code, low code, and obviously process mining. So you could see how topics uh, appear, how they become more visible or they lose a little bit of visibility. So I would say that now we are moving uh, more into the process mining, automation, and as we'll move uh, to 2024, additional topic. Okay. Yeah, cool. Then let's talk about 2024. Who participated this year? You don't have to mention all people because I guess it's a quite long list, but just to give some names, who was there? Yeah, so you will have some names uh, that we had in the first uh, in the first edition. So we'll have maybe let me take a look at the original list, and I will compare it with participants yeah. from this edition. So from participants uh, from the first edition, we'll have Lloyd Dugan, we'll have Ian Gotts, Harold Kin, and Jim Siner. But mm -hmm. additionally, some other great participants uh, like Professor Rosman and many, many others. For some of them, I I'm still waiting for confirmation or from acceptance from their PR team. So I unfortunately cannot uh, mention all the names, but uh, when the podcast is available, when the post is online, you can go and see who will be in the first edition. And additionally, in a few weeks, early February, we'll have a second edition of the post with additional wow. participants. Wow. I'm super curious to learn more. And so what are the hot skills in 2024? Tell us more. <laughs> It may not be a huge surprise for you, but, but? then AI is a hot okay. topic. And generally, AI literacy and being able to work with all the new technologies, all the new solutions is something very, very hot, uh, which is mentioned by many participants. So I would say that here we have general consensus that nearly everyone mentions it as a hot topic. But obviously, process mining is a hot topic to automation and the various types of improving processes. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm so curious to read all the feedbacks or the, the posts of the people there in the future. And before we go a little bit deeper, and uh, what are the skills we don't need in 2024 anymore? What do we have to let go? Or can we let go? This is a complex question because very, very commonly since many years, I have answers from some of my participants that process modeling or BPMN are no longer relevant. You can forget that, forget about them. Well, I'm not uh, that sure. I'm not uh, fully confident that we don't need to model processes at all because I think that process modeling makes sense. Mm -hmm. I would say, I think there is a famous quote from from one of the from Eisenhower, mm -hmm. that uh, he found uh, that the plans are useless, but planning is invaluable. So I would say that uh, pretty commonly, the actual models don't create huge value, mm -hmm. but the modeling, the figuring out uh, how does the process look like or how should the process look like, discussing with others, yeah. it is something that is very valuable. So I would say that even though it is super easy to have your process modeled or even process suggested by AI tool like ChatGPT. We even had uh, simple, well, there are several solutions that can do it right away. We even did a uh, prototype for this several months ago for Adonis. So it is very easy to have your process modeled automatically, mm -hmm. but uh, it would not give you the insight that you have when you're meeting with people who are doing it. It would not give you the real value that is when you meet with other people from different teams from different departments and you're starting to figure out why does your process look like this what you can change how do you create value with this process so i would say that uh, it may happen that uh, will bpmn or other notations will become irrelevant but the 
general idea of communicating with others, sharing knowledge with others, I think that this is something that will stand the test of time. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I would say the, the process of modeling process is so important to bring the people together to create this common picture of the process. Exactly. And the common understanding. This is so important. Yeah. So how we do it, it is not that important. But that we do it, that people are talking to one another, that they are thinking together, that they are creating some common understanding, it is pure gold. Yeah, absolutely. That's so cool. I love process modeling and that's awesome. Yeah, cool. Let's put that into relationship to the results of my latest survey I did end of last year. I asked a lot of uh, people out there of the new process community what they have on their list as topic for 2024. And topic number five was named by 15% of the participants. And there were about 70-something participants. So all kinds of people being um, responsible for BPM in an organization, working as internal BPM consultants or external consultants. So it's a nice sample of people who participated there. And 15% of them said that they have process mining on the list for 2024 and i was a little bit surprised that only 15 percent of the people have process mining already on on their list they are working on so that yes, was this is very curious it is so interesting topic so only thing that comes to my mind why so few people mention it is that because they may not have to know it how to approach it but there are lots of great courses lots of great yeah. books there are awesome courses by professor van der Alst, so it is really easy to get the knowledge, but maybe they don't have proper support uh, in their companies. Maybe they don't have the data they, they, key, they could use to fill it into the process mining tools and to have some results. So yeah. maybe it is that well, they don't have anything to mine. Yeah, maybe. That's absolutely a challenge to get the data, for sure, also from my experience. But I also talked about that with Jean-Marc Eriot, who was my guest, I think, two episodes ago. He is leading the process mining initiative at Mann and Hummel. And he was also surprised that only so few people are working on process mining or have that on the list for this year. And I think for sure, at first, you need to establish a process culture. So have a basic understanding. You have to enable the people, train them for basic BPM topics. But then you should start early with process mining. That was what he also recommended at that time. So that's interesting. It's good to hear. That's also on the radar of so many people that participated in your survey. Then AI has also been in the top topics on, on my list. So it, it's basically part of number two, where 43% of the participants named topics like they want to improve their process, digitize, automate, or use AI to optimize processes. So, But only a smaller number specifically named AI. So that's definitely a topic you should think about to learn more about how to apply that. And for sure, it's buzzword and there's, <laughs> there's a real hype about AI and it takes a step Further, you have to really deep dive into it to understand how to apply that to your processes on the business process level, as well as onto process management. You already mentioned using ChatGPT to suggest a process based on just say, tell me, describe a process for, I don't know, incoming goods or something like that. And then it types down or even paints a model of, of a process. But that's not the common understanding and you miss the process of creating this picture together. Mm. So that's why I'm really skeptical. But anyways, we have to discuss that and work with AI to understand it and to be on the same level with the business people to help them improve their processes. So that's super interesting. Automation is also part of improving mm -hmm. processes. But on my list, topic number one was the challenge to inspire people for processes. So all this yes, basic I work. I love this. Yeah. this was that also named? Edit. Besides my contribution, were there also other participants uh, in your research who talked about these establishing a process culture, get people excited about processes, that this is a skill you need in, in 2024? 
Well, maybe not uh, directly like this, but uh, many touch the soft topics, soft skills like uh, communication, involvement, change management. And I love that you had it very clearly how to inspire people for processes. Some years ago, I even had additional roundup posts where I also invited uh, BPM experts and asked them, how to do it, how to sell BPM in organization. Mm -hmm. Because I can see that it is, well, it is relatively easily, it is relatively easy to introduce the tool to a company. It yeah. is relatively easy to train people how to model processes. It is not rocket science to tell them how to improve the process, how to search for waste, how to communicate with others, how to simulate the processes, how to compare variants. This is not a big deal, but the real thing is how to make sure that you really have the process management processes, that this mm -hmm. is alive, that you don't have lots of process models that are dead after half a year because nobody cares about updating them. The life happens and you have models and you have life. Yeah. And there is widening gap between two of them or how to make sure that the process owners actually care about their processes, what do they think in terms of their processes. Again, one joke, one of my colleagues uh, told that recently, that some time ago, he had the luckiest day of his life because uh, he was at his customer side and he noticed that uh, two of the top managers were having an uh, argument. And they were arguing next to the process architecture and showing the processes and discussing how it should look like. Ah. And he said that now I know that I had real impact. I yeah. made something that was important enough for them to argue over. They were arguing over processes. Exactly. So it shows that they started to think in terms of processes. And it was absolutely amazing. Yeah, that's so true. Uh, I love that example. And taking your immense experience and putting that together, what are your top three recommendations to get it to a more human-centric BPM approach to get people excited about processes? Well, I would say about uh, two aspects, first of all. So first aspect, uh, I would say very commonly as process practitioners, we are thinking about the aspects like cost, time, quality. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we need to think about them. Because if we are offering something to our customers, the management wants to see their results. They want to see how it is to impact the bottom line, what is the return on investment. But I would say that it's also worth thinking how the changes that we are introducing will impact our customers, our mm -hmm. environment, the broad society. So how we can make the life of others better with our processes. Mm -hmm. Will the process will be good for the company, but will it be good for the customers, will it be good for others? So I would say that the one thing would be to see something bigger than us, something more important than money, seeing what is the impact of what we are doing on the world outside. And now the second aspect, since we had a look at the outside, of the company. Mm -hmm. Now let's see how do the process uh, impact the lives of our employees? Do our processes make their lives easier? Is it something that helps them, let's say, onboard faster, make mm -hmm. them more motivated? Do those processes help them? I don't know what is your thing, but uh, when I'm meeting with people from my various uh, companies, from my various partners, I see that people, especially after COVID, are working in a slightly different way. They make more errors. They are not that focused. So I would say that important thing is uh, how we can use processes and various tools to help them, to mm -hmm. help them create impact, to help them do something good. So not to think, okay, how to replace them with automation, but how to help them with automations, with good processes, so that they can do something good, so that they can do something meaningful, and how did the process, how could the processes be organized in such a way that people who are working internally in our company can have, maybe it will sound terrible, but how we can organize the processes so that they can have a good life without mm -hmm. spending 
to long hours uh, over time without uh, spending weekends, uh, not with their families, with their loved ones, but uh, by working on the super urgent things that happened because there were some problems with processes. So second aspect would be that you can inspire people to think about processes because this is something that may help them and their colleagues, their peers, to work in a nicer environment, to have a better work-life balance, to have better work experience. So this would be it. And the last one, very commonly, especially now in European companies, we have uh, all the ESG aspects. So we have Mm -hmm. uh, the environmental aspects. So I would say that apart from looking at the outside of the customers, on the inside about our people, it would be seeing uh, the broader view. So how our processes will impact the world, the generations to come? Do we make something that is really beneficial for others? So are we doing something that is, uh, let's say, profitable in the short term, but very, very harmful in the long term? So now this is a little bit more with philosophy and not BPM, but I would say that it really helps if people think of their work their actions mm-hmm. and their processes by having broader contexts, by mm-hmm. thinking about what can we do to eliminate hurry, to eliminate to eliminate stress, to help people do meaningful things and better for the planet, for our children and for others. So those would be the three things, not time, cost and quality, as we would normally say, but people, people and people. <laughs> yeah. I love it. It perfectly fits to the new process approach. And uh, that's great. So to wrap it up, what is your key message to our listeners? Not just with regards to a new process, just overall with regards to your work. or What is your key message? Always try to find uh, people who are smarter than you are and learn from them. Because it is great to have various perspectives, to learn from different bubbles, from BPM guys, from BA guys, from AI guys, from people with various perspectives, because this way you will have better view of what your processes are like, really, of what you should be focusing on. And uh, you won't be pushing your own vision of change uh, by forgetting about different perspectives. So I would say always try to find other people and. Uh, hear what they have to say, communicate with them. I think it was uh, Tom DeMarco that uh, in his great book, Deadline, had something like, I'm now translating from Polish to English, so it may not be exact. But he mentioned something that the key to management is like this. You need to find the good people, the proper people, and then even if you have problems, they will save you. They will do the things necessary for you for you to have the results, uh, for you to have what you want to achieve. And all the other aspects are how he called it administrivia. So small administrative formalities. So <laughs> small administrative administrative stuff. And I would say that this is really important. Find the good people, people that you can learn from, mm-hmm. people that you're working with, people that you can also help inspire. So you call it it's incredible that you are sharing uh, your knowledge, knowledge of your guests with lots of podcast listeners. Mm -hmm. This is incredible that you're helping people worldwide. And I would invite all your listeners to think if they can share what they learned with others. Because it is great to learn something from others, but it is also awesome to share it, to pass it to the future generations, to pass it to other people, and uh, to enrich others by giving what you got from others and what you learned on your own. Wow. So this would be my summary. Wow. Perfect. Thank you so much. And where can the people find you? Where can they learn more about your work? I think the question is simple to answer, but we definitely have to talk about where can the people find you and the results of your work? Yeah. Generally, the best way would be to go to my website. So bpmtips.com. And you can also find me on LinkedIn. So on those two places, you can find the most relevant updates about what I'm up to, what is happening, uh, for example, with my courses, with other stuff, and maybe some other interesting things that are happening. Yeah. 
perfect. We are going to put all the links into the show notes so our listeners can easily reach the results and learn more. And now I'm, I'm super curious because I'm always asking my guests for a recommendation of a tool, a method, or an expert, which I should have a closer look onto, maybe also invite to the podcast, to get new ideas to rethink processes. So it doesn't have to be from the BPM space, could be from everywhere. What, what is your recommendation there? I have so many people in mind. So I would say each and every of my blog post participant had so great insights. So it would really make a lot of sense uh, to follow them, to learn from them. Luckily, you had a chance to interview quite a few of them. So this is a good one. So probably if I would suggest uh, someone you should uh, you should invite, maybe Adrian Reed. He's not yeah. a BPM guy. He's a business analyst. He's a great uh, a great person with lots of wonderful insights. So I always enjoy his perspectives uh, on lives, on processes, on on how does the business work. So maybe he would uh, he would be a good uh, good guest. Yeah, that, that's a good idea. I'm already following him, but um, now I'm putting him onto my list for podcast interviews. That's that's cool. Thank you for uh, this recommendation. That's great. You're so, welcome. Before we leave the aircraft, I don't know if you already realized that we smoothly landed this episode. Is there anything else you would like to share with our listeners? Yes, obviously. So what I would like to share with you is uh, that it is always uh, good to learn from others. So I would invite you to listen to the following podcast episodes from Mirko and uh, to find other places where you can learn about uh, new BPM and trend, new BPM trends and what is happening. So I would again recommend you following all the people who are participating in my posts because they are doing awesome stuff. They are doing really great work. So if you just find those people on LinkedIn, you will be up to date. You will see what is happening in the BPM area. Perfect. Spitnev, thank you so much. It was great talking to you. Just one final question. How would you describe your flight experience today in just three words? Lots of fun. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Oh, that's, that's cool. I also enjoyed it and it was super interesting. I just can recommend to other people out there, go to bpmtips.com to have a look at the detailed answers of all these cool experts you collected there. Thank you so much for your work. I'm already looking forward to the topics for 2025. <laughs> so we'll see. But first we have to learn about 2024. Yeah. Speaking of, thank you so much. Twelve months. Thank you very much for the invitation. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Let's recap today's new process inspiration. Wow, that was fun. Hope you enjoyed the interview same as I did. I think it's impossible to dive into all the different views of the participants of his research in a podcast episode. So you have to visit bpmtips.com to get all the details. But it was interesting to learn that there is a common sense that AI and BPM, process mining and automation are the skills you need to learn this year. This also fits to the results of my recent survey, but I have to point out that only 15% of the survey participants said that they already have process mining on their list. Same applies to AI and BPM. Even if this is part of the huge cluster to improve processes, it seems to be only on the list of smaller percentage of organizations. So make sure you don't miss this. And what I also have to point out is that you have to implement a process culture first. So learn the basics before you can successfully go into topics such as process mining, automation, or AI. As a specific call to action, here are my three recommendations to prepare yourself for 2024. First one is get a broader idea of these skills by reading the answers of Spignev's research at bpmtips.com. Second, Join New Process Pro to join forces with other BPM enthusiasts to learn more about these topics in special interest groups, which we are planning for the course of 2024. To do so, 
just go to newproslab.com slash pro. And my third recommendation is to visit the New Pros Conference in April, where we have all these topics on the agenda. To get your tickets, just go to newproslab.com slash conference. So in the next episode, we'll have another expert interview, but I don't want to reveal too much today. Just make sure to follow the New Process podcast to not miss the next episode. For now, thank you very much for listening. Have a great day. Bye-bye and auf Wiedersehen. You've been listening to the New Process podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode for more tools, methods, and best practices to rethink your process and push it to the next level. Next level. Thank you for listening. Before you leave, as I mentioned in the episode, we'll have special interest groups on all these topics on New Process Pro in the course of 2024. So let's join forces and become a New Process Pro for free by heading to newprocesslab.com slash pro. Have a great day. Bye-bye. And one more thing. The agenda for the New Process Conference is set and I have a special offer for you today. So the conference is not like all the other boring and dusty conferences you know from the past. It's going to be a real event. So you can expect five sessions about how you can rethink processes and help others to get excited about them. The sessions are about gamification, AI, psychological insights, how to leverage branding for your process, and for sure, it's about how to rethink your process. There will be, in addition to these deep dive sessions, 10 bar camp sessions with insights from really inspiring people and companies like DRF Luftrettung, Kemner Bau, Lufthansa Technik, SAP, IO, SCORE, and more. You can even have a tea with tea. There will also be a live podcast about why we are here, a meaningful conversation about processes, expeditions, and purpose. You can meet to exchange with 100 fellow BPM enthusiasts and receive practical input you can easily take back to your work. So get ready for a different kind of BPM conference. No sales pitches, just real BPM enthusiasts. No glossy success stories, but real practical experience with relevance to your daily work. No tool focus, but 100% human-centric. You can find the tickets and all the information about the conference at newprocesslab.com slash conference. And the best thing, if you use the coupon code podcast, you'll receive a discount of 249 euros if you buy your ticket until January 19th, 2024. I'm really looking forward to meeting you in person in Seeheim. So get your tickets now, go to newproslab.com slash conference and don't forget to use the coupon code podcast.